I have uh, 20 minutes for the rules of this talk to go. So before I start the timer, I have to tell you that I woke up this morning and I thought, damn it, I don't have like a really cool opener. So I got to think of it. And I went for a run and I run, I run a lot. Like I'd probably run 1,200 miles a year and I have for 25 years. And in all my years, this has never happened to me before. Are there any run runners in the crowd? Anybody? Okay, runner. All right. So if you run, you know that when there's no sidewalk, you have to run down the left side of the road, not the right side. That's the safe running place. <laughs> this is literally like all I can think about while I'm trying, like I'm running and I'm thinking about how cool my little thing is going to be. And I see this lady, she's running. I'm coming up behind her. It's so hard to come up behind people running because you don't want to scare them. She's running in the middle of the left lane. And for me to go around her and not get in the right lane, I have to run down the middle of the road. And I've got my dog, and he runs on my right side. So I pass her, and she goes, Six feet, man. God. <laughs> I cannot get this out of my head. And so I'm like, come on, lady. I, I didn't say this, but I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scare. But I'm actually freaked out and mad because she put me in the position where I'm going to fail. And like, I'm putting my dog at risk, I'm getting run over by a car. I'm so pissed at this lady. So I look back. And she's doing this. I'm not kidding. I can't believe it. And she's walking across the street to the sidewalk. And she runs on the right side of the sidewalk. And I'm already 50 yards ahead of her. So it doesn't matter where she's running. But that's how mad and flustered she was. And it's getting me mad and flustered. And then I realized this is a test. The universe is testing the model that I'm going to talk to you about. <laughs> And so my opener happened, thankfully, with a really cranky lady who was running. By the way, I measured the road. It's 12 feet wide on the left side. She was in the middle, so I gave her six feet, which I've never heard before. Anyway, all right. OK, so I'm going to start off with a little audience participation. Uh, it's not a true or false thing, because um, just because it's not true or false. But I'm going to need everybody to participate. And what this is, is myth or unpopular truth. OK, everybody ready? Yes? OK, all right. OK, myth or unpopular truth. People love cold calls and usually respond positively to them. Huh? Unpopular truth. Oh, interesting. OK, any myths? Myth. Okay. All right. There's no right answer or wrong answer. That's why it's a myth or unpopular truth, by the way. All right. I'd like you to remember this time. Okay. Time is the word to remember for this prompt. Okay. Here's another one. Myth or unpopular truth, living paycheck to paycheck totally is manageable if you just stick to your budget. Anyone lived paycheck to paycheck in their life? Come on. It's totally manageable, right? If you're Stick into a budget? Yes? Truth? No. Unpopular truth? Myth? Unpopular truth? Myth? It's both. Scarcity. Remember the word. OK, myth, this is my favorite one. Myth or unpopular truth? Before I buy the new iPhone, I'm totally going to look up Apple's financial statements, <laughs> and I'm going to see how they're spending my money. Myth? All right. Accountability. Remember this. This one's for Hannah. Truth, myth, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Popular truth. Any myths? Anybody? OK. This is uh, insider baseball for the nonprofit folks. Uh, North Texas Giving Day is awesome. We love it, right? <laughs> I need to, myth, I need to hear it. Unpopular, Unpopular truth. <laughs> Competition, keep that in mind. 
Okay, uh, Amy, I debated on putting woman, man, woman, person, but the quote historically is the clothes make the man. So forgiveness, please. Truth or unpopular myth? I mean, myth or unpopular truth? Myth. Okay. I was also going to add, I thought of this on my run, fake it till you make it. Myth or unpopular truth? Unpopular truth. I should have gone with that one. Okay. Branding. Remember it. Okay. Myth or unpopular truth? Asking people for money is easy if you know what you're doing. Come on. Be loud. All right. Good. It's good. Generosity. Keep it in mind. Time, scarcity, accountability, competition, branding, generosity. I'm going to tie these things together. My name is Andrew Snow, and this is my Texas talk. I want to lay out the unseen and unnoticed perils of managing nonprofits in a unique market. I say unique because our rules are different than the for-profit rules. And I want to tie that together and show how a really tricky definition of generosity always gets in the way. We're going to go lightning fast for this, so get ready. All right. So I mentioned time. Time, to me, defines building relationships between donors and nonprofits. It takes forever to do this. That is an unpopular truth. Many, many times my company gets called with a request to write grants. Please, please, we need grants, we need money, we're dying. Also, we get, oh, this grant's not good. I don't like the way it's written. The words are not good. We have seen one word response grant applications win millions of dollars from foundations not because that was a really great one word, but because there was an established relationship between the asker and the ASCII. My point here is this. He could answer one word to that because he had a relationship that was so tight that before he even submitted his application for the grant, they knew not only what he was asking for, but what they were going to give and why they were going to give it. That's an extreme example. But the point is, it takes time to get there, and a lot of people don't like giving time to things. This is a quote from Philanthropy Works. They did a survey of major gift officers. And this particular officer, this, by the way, is not, this is in the middle of the asks. This isn't like the, the best answer or the worst answer, but this is right in the middle. Three, two to three years, five to six meetings is what it takes to close a gift for $100,000. If you're a nonprofit that exists right now and you think that you're going to have that really awesome ask, luckily with some millionaire guy, that might happen. It happens sometimes. There's some examples of that. Most of them are like this. Scarcity. Um, scarcity is a mindset that I think, in my observation, is a very, very normal and okay thing to feel when you're in a nonprofit. Remember, I used the paycheck to paycheck piece. Nonprofits most often are worried about spending too much money, running out of money. And I'm telling you, Hannah, I owe you $5 for saying when I was at SMU. I always say this, she makes fun of me. Even at SMU, which has perceivably unlimited amounts of money, there are countless times in every day where the decision to do something or not do something because there was enough money or not enough was made. The scarcity mindset is very real in the nonprofit industry. This is from WebMD, and I think this is actually the best quote, even though there were lots of nonprofit sources that had scarcity mentality quotes. Scarcity mentality is not something you do on purpose. It's the background noise your brain makes when you can't get what you want, but it'll cost you. And it goes on to talk about the cost in how you operate in life. And for nonprofits, is it not true that when you have the scarcity mentality, that's going to trickle down into how you manage your team. It's going to trickle down into how you convey your message. It's going to affect every bit of your operation and your mentality when you're out there trying to do your thing. 
Okay, this one pisses me off the most. <laughs> Accountability. Oh my God. Uh, how many times have you heard in the last 10 years, transparency is key for nonprofits? Does anybody hear this? Like, yeah, all the time, right? How are they spending your dollar? If you're giving them money, they need to be responsible with it. I think that is bullshit. Now, hold on. Actually, I don't. Everybody here needs to be really good at spending the money. You want to spend your money well and do good things with your money. I'm not disputing that. But I would argue that if you're a donor and you don't already believe in the organization that you're giving to, then don't give to them. If you don't already have that trust because you love the impact they're making, then you don't know them well enough to be giving to them. So to me, donors should also be holding themselves accountable for who they're giving to. Now we've created this whole thing where nonprofits have to really worry about how they spend their money. It totally fuels the scarcity piece and it keeps nonprofits from getting things that they need to get done. So this is from Charity Navigator. So if you're not in the nonprofit world, there's a couple of, uh, websites that grade you and they literally give you grades. I mean, I know there's that in the for-profit world, especially in the credit industry, but in the nonprofit world, it bugs me. Because they are often funded by the generosity of donors, they must be held to the highest financial stewardship standards. We could spend seven Texas talks on this, but I'll move on. Accountability, it's hard for nonprofits. Good? Okay. Am I right? I mean, yeah, okay. All right, competition. This one's an easy one. 38,849 nonprofits in Dallas area. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. This blows my mind. I, 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 this slide speaks for itself. I actually talked to a nonprofit fundraiser guy who was supposed to be here. I'm totally irritated that he's not here, uh, Chris Kulak, in case you're watching. Uh, he, I asked him, how, how many nonprofits do you think are in Dallas? And he said, 8,000, 8,000, I think is the last number I saw. And when I told him 38,000, his jaw dropped. He said, that's wrong. He sent me this. He, he looked it up and he sent me this 38,849. So by the way, North Texas giving day, if you're not playing in the game, you're not in the game. Competition is hard. Branding. Um, okay, so fake it till you make it. Clothes make the man. Sorry, mom, for not wearing the blazer. Um, this is a really, this is a tricky one because it's something that uh, costs money. Good branding costs money. Um, I think everybody in here is probably affiliated with some sort of brand conversation they've had in their own business or nonprofit. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in order to stick out, and get attention of donors, you have to look like a winner. And I, again, this is an observation, perhaps an unpopular truth, but if you don't look like a winner, you're not gonna get winners. I'm gonna use Wes Keys. Happy birthday, Wes, where are you? Wes in the back. Wes Keys is the executive director of Brother Bill's Helping Hand. Wes Keys took over as executive director in 2017, and his organization was had an annual budget of 708. I'm sorry, annual revenue of 718 thousand dollars. They were basically a food pantry. I'm painting in broad strokes, Wes. When Wes came in, what he brought with him was a new energy, and that new energy could not just come in the form of Wes saying, "Hey, we're new and we're innovative." He had to show everybody every which way possible that they were now an innovative thought leader that was there to take action in West Dallas and now grow to South Dallas. That means if you're going to be a winner, you got to start looking like a winner. And that's what Wes did. I'm not saying that his rebrand took him in five years to $4 million in annual revenue, but I am saying that the infusion of energy and the appearance that he took on, that he is a big player and that that organization is here to do real good, did translate from the website and the logo all the way into their operations and into their psyche and into their mentality. Solid work, Wes. Happy birthday, by the way, it's his birthday. Oh, I do actually, I wanted to do one more thing. 
on the branding thing, um, we do have a client here that <laughs> is faced with rebranding. And they got a quote from a company for $50,000 to rebrand. Let me tell you how hard that decision is, okay? Let me use my laser. Oh, shit. There we go. All right. $50,000 for this organization is not a small percentage of their revenue. Think about the accountability that they will face if they say, look, I had to spend $50,000 to get new drawings to put up on my website. I had to spend $50,000 for typography, for iconography. This is stuff that people who don't understand this will say, oh, why are you spending that money? That's ridiculous. Scarcity fuels it. That might be the last $50,000. That might be a staff person that I really need to hire to do uh, counseling for, my, for the people that we serve. You see how this all feeds each other. It's tough to be in the world of nonprofits. It's tough to run it. You're having to juggle all of these things. What do you do? So think about my runner person. Think about generosity. So where donors play a role in this is obviously generosity. That's what defines them. That's what makes them donors. This is me. My, I'm the source of this quote. <laughs> People are complicated. They're fluid. They're unpredictable. And that makes asking for stuff hard. Uh, I was, I looked up generosity on, online, like the dictionary thing. And um, it, it, there's <laughs> the definition that you get on Google is uh, the quality of being kind. And I think on the surface, that is actually really easy to agree with. Um, it is the quality of being kind. But to me, a quality of being kind is like that's a state of being when perhaps if it is a state of being, you can change states of being. So. Someone, I used to say this all the time, someone is either generous or they're not. And I used to really believe that. And then this Thanksgiving, I watched several Christmas movies. And I came up with this. Okay. I think that generosity is a range between conscious decision making and subconscious decision making. And I think that you have to have this kind of decision-making opportunity never to all the time. All right, so that's my framework. Christmas Eve Scrooge, before he was visited by his, the three spirits, was a conscious never giver, right? Does everyone agree with that? Yes? All right. Buddy the Elf grew up in the North Pole. Giving is innate in him. He is, I mean, Santa and the main elf guy, they raised him. He's buddy. He's, it's subconscious. He's always going to say yes. I don't think that Scrooge became like buddy on Christmas Eve. I think Scrooge became a conscious giver on Christmas Day. And here's, has anyone seen Spirited, that new movie? All right. I don't want to give anything away, but we see Scrooge hundreds of years later, and we see that he still has to tell that Christmas Eve Scrooge, he kind of has to keep him at bay because he's still thinking through the fact that he wants to be a generous giver. So he's making conscious decisions. <laughs> This one's an elusive category, and Santa fits in it. So to me, a subconscious rarely giver is someone who's pretty loyal to things. Um, Santa, obviously, giving is innate. He's freaking Santa. Um, but he only gives the nice kids stuff. He doesn't give the naughty kids, at least historically. I don't know. My household sometimes is a little different. But. So what does this mean organizationally? If you're in a nonprofit and even if you're in a business, you can probably slice your own clientele and your own donors into this sort of framework. So your, your Christmas Eve Scrooges 
don't bother with them. On an organizational level, we give this advice all the time because our clients are in the business of efficiency. We got to go, we got to focus our energy where it's going to pay off. Don't bother with the, uh, the conscious never givers. Put all your energy in the yeses. Um, is anyone familiar with the Enneagram? Please hold up your number if you are. Hold up your numbers, hold up your numbers. Okay, is there, are there any twos here? You know, there's a two, all right. So twos, the Enneagram is this personality thing. It's really great, check it out. Uh, there's one category called the helper and they're the twos. Jen, forgive me for saying stuff about things I don't know a whole lot about. I just hear it from my wife. Twos are subconscious always givers. I know I can always call Hannah and Hannah will come help me with anything. Even if she doesn't know how, she's there to help. That's a two. Keep that in mind, keep twos in mind because I'm gonna come back to them. All right, so if you're in the nonprofit world, I think that conscious, more frequent givers, are ticket buyers. So when you have an event, you wanna sell sponsorships, you wanna sell tables, these guys are always gonna buy tickets. The elusive table buyers, if they're not one of your donors, they're probably someone else's donor and they're probably buying tables. That's okay, you can go get them. You just need to remind them a little bit more of who you are. So from an organizational level, this is how the Scrooge model kind of plays out in my mind. So what does this mean to each of you individually and when it comes to generosity? All right, again, Jennifer, my wife, uh, turned me on to this model, which I think is, uh, it's a very old model, it comes from it's a yoga thing, right? Yoga, can I say it? It's yoga. This is yoga right here, ish. This is an old model that describes people. So you've got layers. Your outer layer is your conscious self. We're interacting consciously together, right? This, is, this one's easy. Okay, the next layer is your body. Your body's talking to you right now. Some people have to get up and go to the bathroom. They're ready for me to start, stop talking. Some of you want a cup of coffee and you just want to get up and go get the coffee. Some of you are thinking about lunch. Some of you are cold. Some of you are hot. Some of you have clammy hands. Some of you wonder why there's Bloody Mary stuff in the back and would that actually be good on a Friday afternoon? Your body is sending you constant signals and they don't stop. They don't stop. If you think they stop, then I'll leave you here, but they don't stop. Your body's always telling you something. If you know what your subconscious self is telling you right now, I would love the number for your therapist because this is a hard part to get to. I have been learning this over the last year. The subconscious is complicated. It's where things are hardwired and I kind of want to use the two as an example. Uh, and this is not you, Hannah, by the way. Uh, the two is the always subconscious helper. And you think, oh my God, I thank God for them. They are just so kind and they're so good and I can always call on them. And you know what they might be thinking is I have to say yes to everything because my grandma told me that if I don't do what people ask, I'm going to help. And that's why I'm stuck helping all the damn time because of grandma. Now, she may not know that that's going on on the subconscious, but it is, and it's feeding her conscious activity. So, I should also point out, oh, I didn't, sorry, hang on. I should also point out that the middle circle um, is sort of your cosmic self, your soul, your heart. And I do think that, and if I didn't think this, I wouldn't be in this business, that everybody does have a good heart and wants to be good. But if you think about Scrooge, what happened in his subconscious? I mean, we went through the whole Christmas past and the guy had a really lonely life. He had a lot of trauma. He had a lot of stuff that he went through that really made him this curmudgeon. It made him Scrooge. There's a word for it now. That guy's a Scrooge. That is innate and hardwired in his subconscious. And so now his conscious self goes about life saying, no, 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 I can't do anything. Again, what does this make mean for us? What does it mean for generosity? To me, generosity is an alignment with the subconscious 
and the body and the conscious. To me, it is when everything comes together in the perfect way. And that is what makes asking for things so damn hard. Because you're not, it's obvious that people want to support children. Uh, come on. So why don't we all the time? Okay, here's the thing. I don't have answers for this. <laughs> But I do know this, picking up, uh, actually, picking up new habits is easy, especially when done alone. Myth or unpopular truth? It's a myth. I mean, I think it's a myth. And that's the middle of this little Venn diagram, discipline. It takes discipline. And damn it, <laughs> I mean, discipline isn't, a thing that you just that just happens, right? Nonprofits, for those of you not in the space, they do some of these really well sometimes. And it's not because they don't get this, it's because the balance of this is really, really, really hard to achieve. Plus the fact that you are not just working with surface level conversation, you're not interacting with other people's bodies, you're trying to break through all that and appeal to whatever their subconscious is to respond with generosity. And that's hard. And that's where I leave you today. <laughs> um, I really do. That, I, I, I want to leave you with hope, and frankly, um, my intention is not to leave you uh, hopeless, but if you are in the nonprofit space, if you're thinking about getting into the nonprofit world, if you interact with nonprofits, my hope is that you will now see what all they balance and what the challenges are that come together and how they have to wade through these things in order to lead well and do well. And as a donor, as an individual, as a person who can be generous with others, I encourage you to stop running past the mean lady and think, man, maybe today's not her day. Maybe I'll pass her tomorrow and she'll say, good run, good job, good job. You're a fast runner, go. <laughs> but don't expect everybody to be like that every day. Don't expect it of yourself. But do be aware, generosity is fluid, nonprofits are hard. The end. <laughs> <laughs>